Good evening, everyone. So as most of you know, uh, but maybe some of you don't, I'm Jack Lapsley, and I teach Old Testament here at Princeton Seminary. And I'm also the director of the Center for Theology, Women, and Gender. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, Dr. Julie Claussens. She is a graduate of Stellenbosch University, but more importantly for us, she's a graduate of Princeton Theological Seminary, and we are thrilled to have her back. Uh, she earned her PhD in Old Testament here in 2001. She is currently the chair of the Department of Old and New Testaments at the University of Stellenbosch in the Faculty of Theology, and she is also um, the head of the gender unit there. And I mentioned that she has a flyer about the gender unit at the Faculty of Theology at Stellenbosch, and she has more of them. So if you're interested in what they're doing there, um, we have some flyers after the lecture. So uh, be sure to uh, ask for that. Professor Claussens is the recipient of numerous awards, including the prestigious von Humboldt Prize. She's the author and editor of over 50 articles and essays, the editor of four books, and the sole author of three more, including, uh, in 2004, The God Who Provides, Biblical Images of Divine Nourishment. In 2012, Mourner, Mother, Midwife, Reimagining God's Liberating Presence. And most recently, just last year, her book, Claiming Her Dignity, Female Resistance in the Old Testament, which received an award from the Catholic Press Association this year. It's a special pleasure to welcome Julie back to PTS. Um, I remember fondly her uh, sitting on, in on her uh, oral exams for her doctorate. <laughs> I don't think she remembers it that fondly, but I remember <laughs> fondly <laughs> uh, participating in that. Um, and in any case, I think we all knew then that she would go far in the field, and so she has, and we are delighted to have her back. The title of her lecture is The Case of the Trafficked Princesses, Trauma Hermeneutics as Pedagogical Tool for Teaching on Gender-Based Violence. Please join me in welcoming Professor Julie Claussens. Um, thank you so much for the very gracious um, welcome. Um, let me say it is really amazing to be home. Um, for those students around here, I don't know if you're some graduate students, um, if it doesn't kill you, it does make you stronger. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, and I mean, just to say thank you to Jack for the invitation. I mean, it's been over the years wonderful to work with you um, on a number of different projects. Also, two of my... Um, uh, three of my professors are here. Let me say two of my prof Princeton professors are here. My doctor, father, and mutter, um, my um, Catherine Sarkerfeld and Dennis Olson, who co-chaired also my um, um, PhD study. Um, so they are both here, so it's wonderful to have them here. And then also Dirk Smith. Um, he's my professor back home from Stellenbosch, who's now your professor here. So if you take, can do take his classes, he's brilliant. He's wonderful to um, also share him with you. So um, but it's good to have him here. And then, um, yeah, some other staff Africans also here. But also I just want to recognize um, Dr. Um, Dion Foster, who's our colleague in um, systematic theology at um, Stellenbosch. He's also the director of the Bayer Schneider Center for Public Theology. Um, who does wonderful things also in terms of justice and reconciliation, and the gender unit falls under them, so that's also why. And he brought the flyers for you, so thank you, Dion, also for that. Um, so the um, paper I'm doing um, is a paper that is, forms also part of a, a new project that we have at the gender unit, and, and the um, pro um, title of this pro um, project is Cultivating Change Agents. Um, and it's sort of thinking along the line what it is we do in terms also um, in terms of teaching seminary students and uh, um, community leaders um, how to become um, change agents, agents of change, thought leaders, to have a different understanding um, also in terms of, um, of gender, sort of an intersectional understanding of gender, so thinking not just in terms of gender but also in terms of race and class and um, sexual orientation. Um, so to, to so become to learn that for themselves, but then also to go back to the communities and become agents of change. Um, so this paper uh, thinks then together also of how the biblical text, which is what I did also my PhD in, um, can serve also as a pedagogical tool for teaching on gender-based violence. 
So. The end rape culture um, campaign in Stellenbosch in 2016 was marked by two striking occasions. One evening in April 2016, the fire alarms went off at 2 a.m. across campus in order to signal the message that the student community no longer will be silent about their fellow students being raped, as in the case of the student who was raped outside one of the Harmony residents, a women's dormitory um, in Salambash, that triggered the protest. And at the Woordfeest, which is a local cultural festival in Stellenbosch, in March of that year, a group of young women drew even further attention to this matter by, in the spirit of the Ukraine group Fiamen, appearing topless at one of the events, clearly communicating that their bodies, even though they are naked, are not for trespassing. These, are two, uh, these two examples of public protest did well to spark public debate on the ongoing reality of sexual violence. However, such public protest should be supplemented with sustained conversations in classrooms, in churches, and other places where people are gathered to learn about the rampant reality of sexual violence that truly is a global phenomenon. In teaching, I have found that stories that narrate the reality of sexual violence is a powerful pedagogical tool for raising awareness regarding the problem of rape that is indeed systemic in nature, but also to consider creative avenues for resistance and transformative change to occur. For the purpose of this paper, I want to do two things. In the first instance, I will give some attention to the question of why stories, both ancient and modern, are so helpful when teaching on sexual violence. In this regard, recent developments um, on trauma hermeneutics offer an important heuristic device in reading the biblical text in a way that does justice to contemporary concerns of pain and suffering. And in the second instance, this paper will consider the potential of a biblical story that is not a typical rape text, the story of what Will Gaffney cre creatively has called the trafficked princesses, as narrated in Jeremiah 40 to 44 for teaching on the subject of sexual violence. Read through the lens of feminist critical and post-colonial biblical interpretation, this quite minor story of the daughters of King Zedekiah, who had been taken hostage by the renegade leader Ishmael, and then passed along like pawns from one group of leaders to the next, draws our attention to the myriad of ways in which women in particular are vulnerable, especially in the context of war and forced migration. This paper proposes that stories like the one of the trafficked princesses in Jeremiah 40 to 44 hold great promise in helping raise awareness about the reality of sexual violence in many communities around the world, and especially in the context of migration and the recent um, refugee crisis. I propose that stories, both ancient and modern, that reflect the trauma of sexual violence are vital in the broader task of teaching students about the reality of sexual violence, and particularly the systemic nature thereof, as well as the creative possibility of female agency within dignity-denying circumstances. Trauma hermeneutic has helped us understand the integral link between trauma and art as means of survival for individuals and communities who find themselves in situations of extreme duress. With regard to the biblical prophets, Louis Stuhlman writes that a book such as Jeremiah can be considered meaning-making art that serves the purpose of helping traumatized individuals and groups to make sense of their suffering. He describes how prophetic literature turned trauma survivors into artists of sorts, active meaning makers who in the process of mapping out meaning in context of radical suffering. By means of poetry, throbbing with raw emotion and pain, as well as the few rather convoluted narratives reflecting multiple layers of trauma and suffering, the authors of the prophetic book sought to capture something of the violence the community had lived through. As Stuhlman writes, this ancient artistic expression refuses to deny the atrocities of war. It protests and dissents. This is art for the sake of community survival, art that defies, not denies, the wreckage of its times. <laughs> 
But beyond its important function to help trauma victims face what had happened to them, these examples of textual art represent and honor the victims of the terrifying violence that the community had lived through in a unique fashion. Indeed, as Stuhlman has said um, well, art steps forward on behalf of victims of unspeakable violence. Art steps forward to imagine a world in and through and beyond the traumatic violence. This act of representing trauma in the form of art furthermore serves as a means by which we as readers can bridge the vast divide in space and time that exists between our own context and that of the biblical writers so many year, centuries ago. Daniel Smith Christopher pointedly writes about this imaginary link between then and now that is fostered by means of a shared understanding of the reality and the effects of trauma the, and thus or we can pause and deal with our human temptation to reach across the centuries to the writer of a work like this and put our hand on their shoulder and simply ask, are you okay? Smith Christopher notes that the reason for this empathetic gesture is the suspicion that many of the writers of the Bible are not okay, and part of our task is to think together about what this means. Indeed, by means of our encounter with textual art that seeks to represent the traumatic events of the past, we become, as Smith Christopher has argued, secondary witnesses to the suffering of others in both the ancient and modern world. A good example of this blurring of time and space um, is what also Holt has, has described as an act of making past time present is to be found in the story that tells of the reflections of a descendant of the Holocaust survivor as he visited Auschwitz, with which she starts her article on trauma, cultural memory, and gender. This young reminisces as follows. Today we go to Auschwitz. By the time we enter, I have changed from being a surviving grandson to being equal, arriving at the gates from the past, in the past. Only now can I finally die with Joseph, Dora, and my father, Hans, Later, as I walk back through the camp entrance at Birkenau, I am reborn in my present life as witness, not a survivor. Actually, this ability of art to forge a connection with viewers from other times and places in terms of the representation of trauma that evokes a measure of empathetic understanding is illuminated by what Pollock, in a fascinating article on art, trauma, representation, um, describes as the performative process in artwork that takes and indexes its own time and creates a new space of encounter. This virtual encounter facilitated by the artistic expression of an individual group from a long time ago in a different corner of the world serves, according to Pollock, as a trans-subjective border linking with its own known and unknown others, its own and others' histories, its own sensitivities to the world. By means of this aesthetic encounter, the reader, viewer, is transported into other spaces and times in an equally affecting way, which can only resonate in the reader because of the specificities he or she brings to the artwork. Moreover, Pollock notes that a particular artistic expression may resonate on some unconscious level with the reader, viewer, that might not have been evident before. This transubjective border linking is illustrated well in the story for which Holt ends her article. She, she writes how another Jewish youth, when he was looking at a display of shoes from some of the Holocaust victims at Majanek, looked down at his own shoes, and upon seeing that the shoes on display did not look that much different from his own, he concludes, it seems as though every shoe here is my shoe. With regard to this ability of stories as expression of contextual art to both represent trauma and forge a connection across time and space in an aesthetic encounter that creates new levels of awareness and insight, in the following section we will look at one particular story that narrativizes the plight of a group of migrant women who are passed along from one renegade leader to another and the potential it holds to speak about the ongoing reality of sexual violation. The story of the traffic princesses, as Will Gaffney so intriguingly calls these royal princesses in Jeremiah 40 to 44, is embedded in a much larger story of violence and murder. In the first 39 chapters of the book of Jeremiah, the reality and the effects of the Babylonian invasion and exile are captured in some of the most graphic and brutally honest poetic images, as the traumatized prophet representing the traumatized people seeks to come to term with the devastating calamity.
in Jeremiah 40 to 43, an episodic narrative is told that outlines some greatly traumatic events that transpire in the aftermath of the Babylonian attacks. One reads in Jeremiah 40 of the shocking events of the assassination of the newly appointed governor, Gedaliah, who in Mizpah had sheltered some members of the royal household, including a number of Judean princesses. The assassination of the governor and his officials by the renegade leader Ishmael is followed by the so-called Mizpah massacre that saw the ruthless murder of 80 survivors from the towns of Shechem, Shiloh, and Samaria, who had arrived wounded and humiliated in Mizpah after the Babylonian invasion. These 80 men that were so brutally slain had traveled to Mizpah in order to bring grain offerings and incest to the temple of the Lord, hence turning to God amidst their great anguish. Outside of the city, a seemingly concerned Ishmael came forward to greet them, um, weeping, we said in Jeremiah 41.6, after inviting the weary travelers into the city to meet Gedaliah, whom the reader knows has been murdered, Ishmael proceeds to slaughter them, throwing their bodies into a deep cistern. It is at this point of the narrative, a context of terrifying violence and mass killing, that we encounter the story of the Judean princesses. After the massacre at Mizpah, Ishmael continues his rule of terror by taking captive the survivors, including the king's daughters, and sending them into exile to Amnon. Amon. The plight of these royal princesses does not end here, though. They are passed off to yet another military leader, Yohanan, who, when upon hearing the terrible things that Ishmael had done, together with his men, go to fight against Ishmael. This military offensive proves successful when Yohanan manages to free all the people that Ishmael had taken into captivity. On the one hand, what one could view Yohanan as the great liberator who has led all the people, the soldiers, women, children, and eunuchs who had been taken hostage by Ishmael out of, cap out of captivity. However, when viewed from the perspective of the trafficked princesses, we see that once again these women have no voice and no choice as they are being passed along from one male leader to the next. They inadvertently end up in Egypt, the place where the liberator, Johanan, leads all the men, women, children, including the royal princesses who survived the massacre at Mizpah. This reference to Egypt is rather ironic, given that in the book of Ex Exodus, Egypt was precisely the place of captivity from where the liberator Moses had led the people. In contrast to Jeremiah 40, verses 4 to 6, where Jeremiah still had some measure of agency when offered the choice as to where he would like to go, in Jeremiah 43, uh, 6, the prophet, together with Baruch, is taken along to Egypt, clearly against his will. We see um, the fierce critique of Jeremiah against this going into Egypt. How much more is this lack of agency true in the case of the trafficked princesses who also find themselves as migrants in a foreign land? Now, this very minor story of a group of women who, like the objects that their society deem them to be, are passed along from one leader to the next could quite easily be missed. However, the hidden story of the plight of the traffic princesses actually offers a great example of a text that, if read through a distinctive lens, focusing on the trauma represented by the text, demonstrates the ability of stories to forge a common connection rooted in a shared sense of suffering. This story narrates not only the trauma of the ongoing reality of the damaging effects of empire and the power struggles that followed in its wake, but also the conceivable reality of sexual viola violation. In this regard, Will Gaffney reads the story through the lens of Black Lives Matter and Say Her Name campaigns, connecting the pain many black women um, in the United States continue to experience by being overlooked or only regarded in terms of their sexual value with the plight of the, these unnamed, unnoticed princesses who have been passed on from one leader to another. She seeks to give each of these women back some sense of dignity by saying her name. Also, Crystal Meyer um, reads the story in the context of migration, specifically in terms of the so-called refugee crisis in Germany. 
She argues that in light of the watersheds events of 3 to 4 September 2015, when Germany and Austria opened their borders, the great number of despondent refugees who entered Germany, the country of their hope and dreams, in search of a place of safety and security for themselves and their families, has much in common with the group of refugees who, after the Mizpah massacre, sought a safe haven in Egypt. She writes, both stories narrate situation after or during war where some people flee to a foreign land out of fear for their life and because they see no future for themselves in their country of origin. Both Myers focus on the plight of the refugees as well as Gaffney's emphasis on the trafficked princesses serve to show how narratives that come from a very different time and place are able to speak to individuals and communities. In Pollock's word, an act of transsubjective border linking. I propose that such an interpretative act may help contemporary readers to ponder the reality and effects of sexual violence. In the following section, four themes will be highlighted that might be conducive to a conversation on sexual violence today. In the first instance, we see how the hidden story of the trafficked princesses, as told in Jeremiah 40 to 44, encouraged us to, um, to with witness witness the trauma of those women to continue to experience violation objectification. This story thus draws our attention to the vulnerable bodies of women who are objectified, sexualized, and commoditized, then, but sadly till this day, in all corners of the world. The fact that one has to look harder and deeper to notice this particular story of sexual violation hidden away in Jeremiah 40 to 44 is a good exercise to also be intentional in looking for those stories of women's violation that as a rule are overlooked and disregarded. To notice the hidden stories of women's violation that often get lost in the wars of men in the biblical text encourages us to be more conscious in finding stories of the violation experienced by female migrants that are not always brought to light. A good example of this regard are the stories that document the sexual violation of female migrants that similarly disappear among the deluge of stories outlining the plight of the so-called refugee crisis in Europe that in particular has hit Syrian refugees hard. In terms of what has been called the feminization of migration, Laura Tenenhaus shows the myriad of ways in which women are especially vulnerable as migrants. In this regard, Tenenhaus cites the work of Katrin Benhold, who highlights the constant threat of abuse from male family members, sexual assault, and rape experienced by female refugees. One refugee named Samar talks about the ways in which women's voices are drowned out, how everyone knows that there are two ways of paying smugglers, with money or with your body. Samar herself, after their family's funds ran out, was sold by her husband and repeatedly raped in order to pay for her family's safe passage to Europe. This reality of female migrants' bodies serving as commodities, often negotiated by male family members in order to ensure the survival of the family, is eerily reminiscent of the plight of the trafficked princesses and the objectification they experienced during their journey to Egypt. Second, the story of the traffic princesses, as told in Jeremiah 40 to 44, draws our attention to the systemic nature of sexual violence. The story that narrates the woman's denial of agency and voice, and conceivably also of sexual violation by their captors, is embedded in a large multi-leveled story of systemic violence. This group that gathers at Mizpah has survived a most brutal display of imperial violence during the Babylonian invasion. At MISPA, these victims slash survivors are not safe, but are rather subjected to a further display of violence, this time from the hand of their own people. In some ways, the events narrated in Jeremiah 40 to 44, including the assassination of Gedalia, the brutal murder of the survivors from the Babylonian invasion, and the forced removal of the people of Mizpah to the Ammonites, is a double blow, because the violation does not come from external imperial forces. It comes from fellow Judeans who are vying for power in the aftermath of disaster. This situation is all the more troubling because it just seemed as things were starting to get better again, especially with the survivors taking the first steps to reconnect with life and return home by engaging in such ordinary acts such as looking for food and eating together that serve as an important part of the arduous process of recovering from trauma. This is in Jeremiah 40, verse 10 to 12. 
Just when people thought the worst to be over, just when they had resumed religious activities, such as going to the temple to worship God and conceivably give thanks to God for surviving the war, violence erupts once more with brutal force. Things today are no different. Women continue to ha have to fend off threats not only from outside, but also from within. Tenant House show, for instance, how many migrant women, it's their own fathers and husbands who themselves have been the victims of violence, who are responsible for the violation. And one does not have to look too far to see how this multi-level multi systemic nature of sexual violence extends throughout our own society, from the home to the workplace, in townships and in affluent neighborhoods, indiscriminately from color or creed. Third, the plight of the traffic princesses, and in particular their lack of agency and lack of voice, mirrors the utter inability of trauma victims in general to speak about what they had experienced. In this regard, Kathleen O'Connor writes that victims can really speak adequately about traumatic violence because memories of violence keep overwhelming them. Language fractures and breaks down, so people are unable to express their experiences, leaving them bereft and isolated. In this regard, a story like the one of the traffic princesses in Jeremiah 40 to 44 conceivably may help victims of trauma, both then and now, to speak about the reality and the effects of violence. It is exactly through the medium of art that such representations may gently help to ease victims into speaking about their violation. O'Connor says this beautifully. This early process of symbol making is a delicate one because literal retellings of traumatic events can call forth recurring memories of the original violence and re-traumatize victims who then remain stuck in the recurring memories of the violence. To protect victims from being overwhelmed again by memories and to expose them gently, slowly, and partially to the violence they have endured, language has to be flexible, elusive, and ev evocative. Ironically, it is thus exactly the absence of the trafficked princess voices, coupled with a profound lack of agency, that quite similar to the plight of the prophet Jeremiah and his scribe Baruch, serves a, a symbolic function. Um, that represents the suffering of the people as a whole. As Elizabeth Boaz notes with regard to the betrayal of daughter Jerusalem in the Book of Lamentations, it is the body of the woman that is representing the body of those who suffer. In the Book of Lamentations, but also in this story of the traffic princesses as told in the Book of Jeremiah, one could thus say that embodied language is used in order to foster a sense of communal identity. Boaz proposes that, Naming suffering through the use of culturally familiar, embodied metaphors helps to bridge isolation. We experience the world in our bodies. Evoking bodies connects us to other bodies. The language and metaphors help remember the body, to bring back together the communal body by the naming of shared experience. In this way, one finds that stories that narrate the sexual violation of a group of women serve as a means for the community as a whole to deal with their pain. This said, one should immediately point out the difficulties with this rhetorical strategy, as it once again offers evidence of how women's broken, violated bodies are used for a purpose beyond their own selves. And yet, from across the divide of time and space, the trauma of another implores us in an ethical moment to do something to prevent others from suffering a similar fate as well. Finally, even amidst the story that narrates the objectification of a group of women who are utterly silenced and almost erased, we do find some signs of resistance that speaks of agency in spite of oppression. Both Gaffney and Meyer read the reference in Jeremiah 44, 18 to 19, of the woman worshipping the Queen of Heaven as a sign of religious independence. Gaffney points out that this group of women, presumably also including the traffic princesses of Jeremiah 41, 43, could be understood as an important sign of women reclaiming their agency by worshipping a deity that is more reflective of their experience. Actually, the fact that these migrants worshipped at all is a sign of recovery. O'Connor writes that victims of trauma quite often lose faith and trust in institutions, traditions, and in God. After disaster, beliefs that once supported life break, um, life break down in a vacuum devoid of meaning.
depends. When the women in particular are singled out for re-engaging in religious activities, it is a sure sign that they are well enough to once more participate in some sense-making activities in their new home. In this regard, Meyer writes that in their speech, the women positively link themselves to the customs of their ancestors and the time before the fall of Jerusalem. They explain their current misfortune with the neglect of a female deity, the veneration of which involved the whole family, as stated in Jeremiah 7, 18. Children gather wood, fathers kindle fire, women knead dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. Thus they resort to a re religious practice that they think is beneficial for, for their life. This account of worshipping the Queen of Heaven in Jeremiah 44 is a compelling example of the difference between the official and popular religion that quite often also has been linked to a gender differentiation in the biblical text. But without drawing moral judgments on the merits of their religious expressions, it is important to recognize the clear signs of female agency that serve as a unique expression of women's experience that often tends to be demonized. For instance, in this text, as also earlier in Jeremiah, all the blame is placed on women who are scapegoats for all that went wrong, as in Jeremiah 2 and 3. However, viewed from another perspective, that's intentional about honoring the women's religious activities as a sign of the agency and equality, the prophet and the book of Jeremiah's overall goal to try and make sense of the senseless so as to bring order once more into a tumultuous world, the worship of the Queen of Heaven can be said to be an attempt by individuals to control their world, deeply believing that their failure to worship the Queen of Heaven is the cause for all the suffering they have lived through. In conclusion, the case of the traffic princesses that is hidden away in the book of Jeremiah tells us something that many of us know all too well in our bodies and psyches. Women's ways in a man's world are never simple and straightforward, but rather quite complex and sometimes even painful, to say the least. Even despite the gains we've made, and there are many, we are left at times without voice and with a limited or diminished sense of agency. However, the fact that we can connect with stories that represent in art the painful struggles of women, both real and imagined, both recent and from a long time ago, is testimony to the fact that we are able to put our experiences into words so as to share our stories with trusted confidence who offer a safe space. From this place, this home place, in Abel Hook's words, we become whole again and strong again to have courage and conviction, continue to work for a world where violence is no more. <laughs>